Today on the future of everything, the future of reinforcement learning. So we humans are pretty interested in learning and we're pretty good at learning. If you ask somebody why they enjoy their job or their hobby, it is very common for them to say something like, I love this activity because I'm constantly learning new and interesting things. Learning itself is, is the reward. Now, with the rise of artificial intelligence, AI, uh, computers are also getting better at learning, but it doesn't come nearly as naturally to computers as it does to us. So computer scientists are working pretty hard to get computers to learn how to do tasks. Recognizing a face, for example, requires a unbelievably huge amount of data and breakthroughs in image understanding really only occurred when tens of millions of images were available to teach computers you know about human faces kittens and fire trucks now i have a 15 year old grandson and in the last 15 15 month old i have a 15 month old grandson and in the last 15 months he has gone from a bundle of sleeping and eating and not much else to walking, interacting with the world, almost talking, and definitely he's a learning machine. And he has learned all this for in 15 months of being a human. He has learned that vacuum cleaners look benign when they're turned off, but are terrifying when they're turned on. He has learned that there are certain things that mommy doesn't want him to touch, and daddy. And he has learned that there's some food can be good, but it's not always good. Can we get computers to learn experientially like this so they can develop capabilities that help humans uh, live better lives? So there are many areas of learning for AI, but one of them is called reinforcement learning, learning from experience to make good decisions. And I guess it's called reinforcement learning because there is usually some reward, reinforcement, when you make a good decision and some penalty, some negative, uh, when you don't, something that we kind of all understand implicitly. And so you try to get better and better by seeking positive reinforcement. Dr. Emma Brunskill is a professor of computer science at Stanford University, and her work focuses on reinforcement learning when experience especially is costly or risky. And so you need to learn fast or there could be bad consequences. Such situations are abundant in healthcare, robotics, education. Emma, this seems like a very intuitive way to learn, uh, but but what is easy for humans may not be easy for computers. And I'd like to know, what are the challenges in, reinfor in reinforcement learning for AI systems, and are we making progress? Well, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think that uh, one of the amazing things we've seen in AI is often once we start to make progress, we realize some things are easier than maybe we would have expected. Uh, recently, reinforcement learning has been used to do things like have uh, computer agents be able to play video games. Um, for some of you who may be familiar with the old Atari games, we now have um, reinforcement learning systems, these type of AI algorithms, that can play these games as well as humans. So in some ways, even though it might have taken you know a teenager um, a few hours to learn how to play these games, we have very good algorithms for doing that now. I think one of the challenges we have is that in those cases, these uh, systems work by trial and error and learning to play these games over millions and millions of games. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's possible for video games because that just requires compute. You just need lots and lots of computers, and then you can have all of them be playing these games, and eventually you'll learn how to win. You can sort of learn to optimize that score. Probably, I would guess, much more experience even than the human experts needed to get to their level of performance. Orders of magnitude more. Okay. So there's some lovely work that compares how fast people learn compared to computers, and people are learning, people's rate of learning on these games is way faster, and the amount of experience they need is far, far less. Of course, we have huge amounts of other experience we can bring to bear, whereas mm -hmm. these computers are learning from scratch. But it's still a case where the amount of experience they need is far more than any human. When we think about using these algorithms uh, for other types of cases, some of the cases I really care about is things like personalized adaptive education. We don't have, you know, um, an infinite number of people to train these systems on. Right. And it matters because if my system takes 100 million people to learn how to best teach people fractions, that's a big deal. Whereas if I could just learn on a few hundred students, that would be much better. Yes. So how, um, just to help us understand, um, my 15-month-old grandson understands when a success and a failure, you know, because of good taste, bad taste, pain and not pain. Um, how do we encode rewards and penalties in computational programs so that they can get a sense of when they're doing well and when they're not doing well? 
I think that's one of the core challenges right now. In um, in things like board games, like the game Go, or in Atari games, um, like video games, there's a score, and the agent is receiving that score. So they know that you know when um, Pac-Man eats a cookie, that then it um, you know it gets an increase in score, and so it's told that's what the reward function is. I think in real systems, one of the critical challenges is what should that reward function be? So I work a lot on educational systems, um, and sometimes that reward system might be um, what is test performance, yeah. but really that's a proxy for what we care about. We care about things like high school graduation rates or people being employed, but those are just really hard to measure and they take a long time to observe. So we often use what we call proxy rewards to things that are more easily measurable mm-hmm. that we hope are correlated with the long-term outcomes we care about. Now, I do want to get to your educational work because it sounds very compelling and you've mentioned it. But before that, just to set up some background, the other thing I know you care about is the theory of learning and actually proving things about what's possible and what's not possible. So um, I've looked at some of the papers and they're very technically, I would say, deep. And so we can't go into the details in this discussion. But I'm wondering if you can give us a flavor of What can we learn by thinking about the theory of learning and what is possible and what is not possible and how that informs your real world experimentation in things like education or healthcare? So a lot of the theoretical work I do is really inspired by the challenges that come up when I think about these educational systems, systems that we want to learn fast. And so I've been, me and my group have been very interested in um, what does it mean to be hard to learn to make good decisions? Why, you know, why might some problems be harder? For why we might need a lot more data to try to figure out what is the right decision there? And one of the things that I think is most lovely is that we found that optimism is provably optimal in some cases. Um, Optimism in this case is, uh, let's imagine that you go to a restaurant and there's a, a couple different dishes. You try one and it's not so good. Um, often many of us might never try that one again. You know, we, we'd always stick to the one. What optimism suggests is that, let's say the chef just had a bad day and that, you know, that first dish is actually amazing. Um, Optimism suggests that you should try things multiple times because over time, either the thing is really better, like Mm -hmm. if you're optimistic and then it will really be good, or you'll learn something. Um, It turns out pessimism doesn't have the same properties. You might never have tried that first dish again, and you might never realize it's good. That is very interesting. (laughs) So so you're saying even the kind of – I'm using scare quotes again, but even the so-called attitude of the algorithm for – well, I think I know what's going to happen here, but maybe I should dip in one more time to kind of make sure or a few yes. more times versus uh, I don't like this. I'm going to move on to another area. Even that kind of strategy can affect the rate at which uh, true things and useful things are learned. Exactly. And not just rate, but it might be that it never even learned the right thing eventually. So maybe that first dish was really, you know, that chocolate chip cake was really great. The chef just had an off day. Um you want to be optimism with, optimistic with your uncertainty about how good things are. And if things really are better, keep trying them. And we can show in some cases that's actually provably the fastest to, to way to learn things. This is The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Emma Brunskill. And we're talking about proving things about learning. And, and I think the important thing that is implied by your comments just now is that you can actually turn these learning tasks that seem to involve words that are fuzzy into precise concepts, and then you can actually do mathematical level proofs, which I I would guess that's extremely interesting because it won't get you, if you can prove something is, for example, impossible, you won't try very hard to do something that's impossible. Or you'll say, I know that this is impossible, so I'm only going to be get, able to get an, an approximate result. So I would guess it puts good kind of cones and boundaries on what you're even willing to go for and try. That's right. And I also think that you know, right now, if we want um, people that aren't Uh, my PhD students, other wonderful PhD students to be able to use these algorithms. We need to do what many of us are talking about in terms of uh, democratization of AI, which means we want these systems to be robust and usable by people in lots of domains. And that requires them to have good, strong properties. Um, We see this in software. You know, people often verify software so we know that on any plane, it's not going to, the plane won't crash if you use autopilot. Similarly, if we want things like reinforcement learning to be robust enough for the real world, I think we'll need these type of guarantees. Yes, because then uh, just to, I think to repeat what you're saying, when we transfer an algorithm from one domain to another, from playing Go to helping a doctor do surgery, we'd like to know that there are certain guarantees about its performance that we don't have to reestablish uh, or worry about if, if they're present or not present. Exactly. Oh, so let's go to the education work. So what motivates um, – so I'm, I'm very interested in your use of uh, – and your focus on education because as 
a child of the 60s and 70s, I was exposed to absolutely terrible computer systems that were trying to help me learn. And I'm positive that any success I've had in life is because I ignored those systems and didn't use them. But I was very lucky to be in a very good schools and have very other options for learning. Um, tell me about the societal need for educational uh, help from software and from AI systems, and then maybe a little bit about how you're approaching it and what you see as the big opportunities there. Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm interested in education is I think it's one of the biggest tools we have for poverty alleviation. I think it's an, uh, one of the things we've seen repeatedly can lead to, you know, um, long term, really amazing benefits for people across their life. And I think now it's increasingly important, actually, with AI and automation that we're going to have skills, ways to reskill people and sort of upskill over time. So we're going to need lifelong education. For example, with the shift in jobs because of automation, as, as exactly. you just said. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So over time, I think we're going from sort of K through 12 through K through 75, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, yes. but I think one of the huge challenges right now and something that was a shock to me when I first learned it is that there are many parts of the world where people don't have access to good education. Um, and it's only been relatively recently over the last 10, 20, 30 years that everyone has sort of primary school education. And I think that because of conflict and other region, other issues, there's a lot of times where people don't access to quality education. Yes, yes. And so those are places where I think that um, software can be amazing. Software can be infinitely replicated. Mm -hmm. Everyone can use it. If we start to get tools that are effective, we can disseminate those and allow more people to learn. Now, have you targeted? So that's makes perfect sense. Uh, given that, have you targeted areas of education that are particularly ripe for opportunity, ripe with opportunity for um, large scale, I, I don't know if you want to use the word automation or dissemination of learning. So what are the topics that the world needs to be able to learn where these AI systems might be able to help? Well, I think there are a lot of different ones, and I think it's really interesting to see how in the educational and sort of data science educational data science community, people are thinking about not just sort of typical hard skills like learning math, but also soft skills like grit or motivation or persistence. Um, I can give a concrete example. One thing that we looked at was fractions learning. A lot of people struggle with fractions. Um, some people might be familiar with uh, A and W. It's a fast food chain. In the 1980s, uh, they were going to launch the third pounder. It was supposed to be a competition with the quarter pounder. And so they did taste tests. The beefs tasted great. They thought this was going to be awesome. It was the same price as a quarter pounder. And they launched it and it flopped. And it was because everybody thought that a third pound was less than a quarter pound. Um, and I think that illustrates that wow. a lot of us don't, you know, fractions are hard. <laughs> fractions <laughs> are tricky. And um, and it has real implications if we don't understand these things. And so a lot of my own work has thought about fractions learning. Okay. And so in one of our um, uh, collaborations with Zaran Popovich up at University of Washington, we thought about how could we create like an educational game and optimize it to help people persist for longer, get people to learn more. And that was one of the first places where we used reinforcement learning to amplify that. So that sounds great. Uh, this is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Emma Brunskill about uh, learning about fractions. Um, what was the key insight about getting people to stick to their fraction lesson? It sounds like if I'm getting it what you said, they stuck to their fraction lesson a little bit longer and they learned a little bit more. Um, was it a pat on the back? And, and how do computers give pats on the back? Well, one of the things there is it introduced this other core question of how do we take information about past decisions that were made and their outcomes and figure out what we should do in the future? We often call this sort of counterfactual or what if reasoning. You know, what if instead of listening to this podcast, you'd went and got coffee? You know, how much better would your life have been? <laughs> well, you can't know that, right? You can't have seen that alternative future. Um, but there are statistical ways to try to estimate that. Uh -huh. So we use some of those in this case to take old data from around 10,000 students um, to figure out better pathways, better adapt pathways for students. And the great thing was that we could use these type of machine learning statistical methods to estimate that we could improve persistence by 30% by being more adaptive. And then we ran a study with another 2,000 new students and found that indeed we improved persistence by 30%. So the reason that's significant is for two things. One is that machine learning can really help, that there are yes. cases where we can greatly optimize um, compared to past sort of expert-like performance. And then the other is that we could predict this before we deployed it. So we're sort of predicting the future. We're saying, before you deploy the system, I can tell you how much better it's going to be. So that's interesting. So in this case, you had enough experience with previous students that um, 
you didn't just passively kind of look at what their track through the software or through the problem was, but you actually inferred that um, you could prune their path in some way. Like they made, maybe they made some false starts and it sounds like you were able to recognize those false starts and say, if we avoid that path, we might be able to get them to their goal a little bit faster. I mean, is that a fair so, way? Yeah, that's, and let me just say, so what we were doing here is deciding what activity to give to the student after each, after they complete each one. So it was a series of sort of um, these video games activities. And the question was, what order do you give them to students um, in a way that's adaptive, depending on how they've done, to maximize persistence? And so what we found there is that by kind of stitching together different peoples, maybe maybe you did um, mm -hmm. activity one, two, and I did it act activity one, three, we could figure out which of those is better for future students. Yes. And then, and then um, how did the students respond to these, to, to, how do they respond to these systems? Um, they must be aware of making progress, and so there must be a certain uh, kind of internal reward system. Uh, is there any kind of, is the system also rewarding them in some way, other than the acquisition of the skill? I think it's a really interesting question. One thing we've found, um, not in this system, but in other systems, that exposing information to students about their own learning is often itself really productive. So sometimes there are things like skill bars or other visualizations which allow people to know that they're progressing. Yes. Um, and one thing, as you alluded to earlier, many of us find it very motivating to observe progress and to feel like we, you know, we have, we're making, um, we're learning ourselves. And exposing that back to the learner itself can be very powerful. So when will these systems uh, be available? Is is there a path from the research lab to deployment? And I'm sure you think about that because your work is motivated by real world yeah. problems. What does that path look like? I think it varies. I think one thing is that there's still a lot of sort of foundational questions to get right. One of the things we're starting to do in my own lab is reach out to new potential partners um, to think about uh, how these uh, types of ideas can be used in really large systems, things like MOOCs and other things, massive open online classes. Thank you. Um, Thank you for defining <laughs> yeah. your abbreviation. <laughs> Where, um, you know, right now most of those use still uh, often pretty traditional ways of teaching, kind of giving a lecture and then having people do activities. There's not normally a lot of adaptivity or personalization. And so I think these type of techniques could be used in conjunction. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Dr. Emma Brunskill about reinforcement learning, education, and other AI approaches towards acquisition of knowledge and skills, next on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Emma Grums Brunskill about learning, machine learning, uh, and reinforcement learning, especially in the context of education in our last segment. And now I want to move to healthcare. So that's another area that I know you're interested in. Of course, it's near and dear to my heart. What are the opportunities and challenges and, and accomplishments for um, these kinds of learning methods in healthcare? Yeah, so one of the things I was saying before is that one thing we do with this educational system is to try to leverage old data that was collected and um, and about and, and the outcomes and try to infer what we should do in this future, this sort of what if, what if reasoning. Um, I think that healthcare records is an enormous opportunity for this. The way that we've seen artificial intelligence and machine learning be applied to healthcare so far is largely in terms of predictive measures, mm -hmm. you know, predicting um, diagnosis or things like that. But to me, one of the real opportunities is to say we're constantly making decisions, treatment decisions, recommendations. Um, can we identify if there's some places where sort of having AI as a co-pilot, we could make even better decisions? And so we're trying to use similar types of statistical methods to figure out how we use sort of sequence of decisions that are being made by doctors um, or healthcare providers and infer if we can find things that might help them make even better decisions. Um, you could imagine, particularly in some cases, uh, that there might be sort of very subtle trends um, that machine learning systems tend to be very good at uncovering, um, mm -hmm. and that might be very beneficial. So just to go back to our discussion of fractions, in that case, you had a lot of examples of uh, fraction learners and their path through fraction learning. And then you had your new learners, and you said uh, even you had a very good idea of how they might be able to learn by stitching together. So can I take that lock, stock, and barrel and transfer it now to physicians where you have lots of patient trajectories through the healthcare system and we're, where we, we might be able to help get to good outcomes faster by uh, stitching together the experiences of other patients to create a new experience? Is that 
That's exactly the right idea. So, um, for example, one thing we're looking at recently is heparin and dosing um, for people in terms of blood clotting. Um, yes. And the question is, can we identify trends in there, which would make us um, able to sort of either learn the same type of decision policies as what clinicians do or potentially even better? I think one thing that's a, um, a big open technical challenge um, in doing this is that when we try to use these algorithms, we often want to have access to all of the features that pe people might be using to make these decisions. So um, in the case of the fractions game, um, the decisions were being made by an algorithm. So right. we know all the features. If the decisions are being made by people, whether clinicians or human teachers, um, there might be all sorts of subtle things that aren't in the data that are really important for those decisions. They might not have recorded they might not major have recorded. factors in their decision. For example, I mean, as a physician, I know that I sometimes prescribe different drugs based to different people based on if it's a once a day or a twice a day. It's very difficult to take a drug four times a day. And so if I have a patient with a very difficult life with two jobs and kids, and then a four time a day drug, even if it's better, might not be practically better because they won't be able to take it, so we'll go for the once-a-day drug. And those kinds of, I rarely would document that. Right, that sort of feature of is someone sort of express verbally that they're super, super busy, um, that information might not be put in the electronic medical record system. But that sort of information is really important if we want algorithms to be able to develop new decision policies that we can reliably predict how well we'll do in the future. Do you find that the medical collaborators that you work with, are they open to these ideas of the systems you could imagine that they would say, oh, the system is going to be second guessing me and I'm, I'm busy and I don't need to have a nagging system reminding me of all the things I could have done. So how do we think about the human aspect of inter, in introducing these systems into very elaborate delivery systems like in healthcare? I think that's a great issue, and that's one of the reasons why um, I love collaborating with other people, including with my HCI colleagues like James Landay, um, which I HCI think— HCI is Human Computer Interactions. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I think that uh, those sort of experts think really deeply about how do we make systems that are really useful for people to right. use. Um, and there are all sorts of important questions that come up. For example, um, you know, what is the, the set of features that we should be writing down to explain these? What are the types of practical constraints? And how do we make these things so that ultimately when they're used with people, you get better outcomes um, because these systems aren't just sort of lose, used in isolation. Yes, and fortunately people are people, and I mean that in a, in a good way that it somewhat simplifies because uh, many people will respond in similar ways even in different situations to new technologies and we can get best practices for that. But, I, but another thing that people do is they worry, and I want to get to the in our final part of our discussion, about issues of um, fairness, accountability, and safety. Mm -hmm. So these systems now have very intimate personal data about me. They know if I'm a fast learner or a slow learner, or, or even if that's a thing. They know if I had trouble with fractions. If it's in the healthcare, they know how much I had a bad disease or whether I was a compliant patient and take, that's the word we use, it's a terrible word, for taking my medications as directed. Um, I'm sure you worry about these issues, and, and how do you approach them? Yeah, I think they're really important um, and critical issues. They're also really um, important technical issues. Um, and I, I and many others are thinking a lot about these aspects. There's, in fact, now new conferences called Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning. So I think that the whole community is really um, taking this issue very seriously. I think one of the things that I think about is how do we make these systems such that they can kind of um, – Obey constraints. So a lot of these systems are trying to do some form of optimization. They're trying to optimize student scores or they're trying to, you know, um, help people, um, their treatment improve. But we often want some sort of constraints on them, something to say, you know, we need these to be fair. We need for different subgroups, um, uh, you know, for men versus women, et cetera, that we have algorithms that are going to do just as well for different subgroups. And I think one of the exciting things to me is we can often form this mathematically. And so we can create algorithms now that not only can be fair, but in sometimes can actually even um, reduce biases that are present in the data. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Allman. I'm speaking with Emma Brunskill about this very interesting topic of fairness and even removing unfairness. So, yes, yeah, so let's say that you, you had made in both of your examples, both for ed education and healthcare, you had looked at historical patterns to try to predict things. But what happens if, for example, in those fraction learners, if it was 80% little boys and 20% little girls, then maybe when you expose the system to little girls, they were not getting the stitched together trajectories that they should be. Um, so tell us, it, I, I'm sure it's very technical, but can you give us a sense for what a, 
a fairness um, algorithm might do to improve fairness when the data that it's based on was not very fair. Yeah, one of the things that we have done, and this has often been worked together with my former postdoc, Phil Thomas, is to think about um, how do we put constraints into the system so that you have sort of this uh, slightly more complicated um, uh, optimization problem mm -hmm. um, where we're looking at both we want to say being able to um, provide these effective systems, but we want to do so in a way that we make sure that, say, for both men and women um, I, or you know different subgroups, that the systems don't unfairly penalize yes. one group at the success uh, of the other. And I think that's the thing that we often think about is we're like, well, we don't want to have a much more accurate system for males than for females. It shouldn't get a better solution for men at the penalty of that. And we can put that in mathematically as constraints. It makes it a little bit more complex to solve and more computationally yes. intensive, but it's possible. So you've used this word constraint. Can you, and it sounds like it has a very technical meaning. Can you give us a, some examples of what constraints might be that would tend towards more fairness? Yeah, so for example, imagine that we're thinking about more like a predictive task, like predicting um, test score performance uh -huh. or something. I would like to make sure that the accuracy for which I can predict men, so let's say I um, you know, can predict them plus or minus one point, yes. I don't want to get an algorithm that can do that that then means that I can only predict for women plus or minus 10 points, or that I systematically under predict for women. Yes. Um, and so we can put that in and say you can't over predict for men more than say 0.05 compared to women, or we so can just you, say you can't. Is, over -predict at all. Ah, so would you perhaps accept a less precise performance for one group in order to make it more fair across all groups? Is that the kind of I thing that might exactly happen? I think that's exactly one of the, the technical questions that we try to answer is, does that mean that you slightly sacrifice performance on one to make sure that it's equally good across everybody? Or are there cases where it's sort of... Um, uh, it, it wins for everybody, and you just end up with a better right. solution. So that second case, of course, is an easy one. Yes. But the harder one, and one which I'm sure would dis require discussion and some social um, uh, uh, agreement, is do we sacrifice performance for one group in order to make it more fair? And there's, I'm sure people who would say, yes, absolutely. And I'm sure there are people who would have trouble with that. And then you, it becomes a non-technical but very important decision that society has to make. Yeah, and I think um, ultimately it shouldn't be computer scientists that are making these calls. It should be society. And in many cases, there are regulations that specify that um, you can't systematically discriminate against one group versus another. And so this is a way for the algorithms to respect those decisions that have been made by our society. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.